begin tonight, let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity once again for you to nourish us by your word. And as we pray this evening, we ask you to continue to remind us of your constant presence in our lives as we walk, as we journey toward you, our final destination. We know we came from you and we are headed towards you. And as we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you for choosing to be here this evening. Uh, even though football is on, you're here. So it's absolutely fabulous that you've made it here this evening. It's good to see all of you back. Uh, there are the sign-up sheets there in the back. If you uh, haven't provided your email address for me, already please write it down and do so legibly i do not do hieroglyphics so it'd be wonderful if you could write it legibly and if uh, you want to take your notes that uh were there in the back you want to and we'll go over them first we are still in the christmas season right now until this coming Sunday, this coming Sunday, we will have the feast of the baptism of the Lord. And so the Christmas season will end and we will go into ordinary time. And before you know it, we will be in Lent because Lent is the beginning of February, Ash Wednesday. And so uh, it's amazing. It just seems like we just had Advent, then Christmas. And then Lent, and it just reminds us how our whole life is passing. Before we know it, we will be back with the Lord. But I want to talk about Christmas, because during the Christmas season, we see and we hear a lot of joy. You have Christmas lights. You have lots of decorations, gifts. And so there's lots of joy all around Christmas. But as you know, for many people, the Christmas season isn't this happy season that it's presented to be. Depression is on the rise during this time of the year. In fact, it increases dramatically. Divorce lawyers report that calls to their offices skyrocket during the first week of January. So this week, divorce lawyers will not be taking a break. Many people gather around their holiday table with not just food missing because they can't afford it, but many people gather around the holiday table with somebody missing because they've experienced a death in their family during the past year. Or somebody's missing at the holiday table because of some estrangement. Families not talking to each other. Families holding grudges. There's a lot of pain. And so grief and sorrow follow this season like shadows. You know that from your own experience. As time goes by, our family members pass away. People that we used to sit around the holiday table are no longer there. And yet, the pressure to be happy and full of warmth and good cheer only adds to the pain and sorrow for so many during this time. What I want us to do this evening while we are in the Christmas season is to look at the Christmas story in its totality. The Christmas story isn't just full of joy 
and happiness and cheer. There is also lots of grief and sorrow and pain that is present there. Part of the Christmas story is the experience of Herod ordering the slaughter of the innocents. Herod ordered every single male under two years old to be killed. Part of the Christmas story is also the flight into Egypt when Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus became a refugee family having to escape. Part of the Christmas story is not even having a place to give birth. Having to give birth in a stable. Darkness follows the Christmas story as well. Grief and sorrow. And in the midst of all of this, what we are called to see is that God comes to dwell in the midst of this mess. There's mess there. And God comes to dwell there. And God chooses to come and enter this mess. God could have chosen to be born into a perfect family. God could have chosen to be born during time of peace, during a benevolent reign, and yet God chose to come into a messy world more than 2,000 years ago as God has chosen to come and dwell in our mess as well. See, what we celebrate during this time is that God has come to be with us, not during time of perfect peace, but in the mess that we find ourselves in, whatever mess that may be. What this time of the year reminds us is that God chooses to live among us in the midst of some terrible, terrible pain. As God chose to live and come among us in the midst of terrible genocidal violence, like the slaughter of the innocents, in the midst of overwhelming lamentation and sorrow. Can you imagine every male child being slaughtered under two years old, the pain, the sorrow, and God came to dwell there as God comes to dwell in the midst of any mess that we may find ourselves in in our lives. Why? Because God chose to become incarnate in the real world. Not in some fake world, but in the real world. And the real world is the world of disasters. Lots of disasters. Look at what's going on right now in the Midwest, the flooding. Can you imagine the people who are seeing their homes drift away, their livelihoods drift away? The terrorism going on around the world, the people who have had to see their loved ones die in terrorism. Also personal disasters like disease and sickness. God came more than 2,000 years ago into a world of predators, disasters, and dark storms. And God comes over and over again into our world, our own personal world, whether it be personal disasters or worldly disasters, to dwell with us. And this is good news, because as terrible as our story may be today, it is a reminder that God doesn't shy away from the hate, the evil, and the darkness in our lives and in the world. It is during the exact moments of pain and sorrow that God makes His presence felt. Think about it in your own life. When is it that you felt the presence of God the most? It wasn't during the great times. It was during the painful times when you went through your own personal disaster, whatever that disaster may be, your own mess that you needed to feel the presence of God the most. And the good news is that as bad as it may get, God is always there. Always there. No matter how terrible it may be. And this is the message of Christmas. 
Not that God's going to be there when we finally get organized and get our house all cleaned up and our own lives all cleaned up. Or maybe that, you know, uh, God's going to come and be with us when we finally feel like we have faith enough to move mountains. No. In the midst of doubt, when we doubt, and so many of us do all the time in our life, we have doubts. In the midst of anything that we may be going through, God is there coming to dwell with us. And so the message of Christmas is a very messy message, if you take it in its totality. It's very messy. And it is precisely when things are falling apart that God comes to be there. And so the joy that is in our life is at the presence of God. You see, uh, the Magi, when they beheld the child Jesus, the Bible tells us that they were filled with unspeakable joy. And the English language doesn't do this justice because the New Testament was written in Greek. And in Greek, for example, uh, there's lots of ways to describe one thing like joy or love in in English we for love we just have love you know we we say I love pizza I love food I love this we use love there's just one word love well think about it those of you who speak Spanish you don't say yo amo pizza right you just don't say that well in Greek there's lots of words to say love there's the love between a husband and a wife. There's the love between friends. There's the love among a community of believers. Just like there's different ways to say love, there's different ways to say joy. We won't get that sense in English because uh, it doesn't convey that very well. But those of us who speak other languages, we know that. And there's lots of you here who speak other languages. If you just speak English, well, you won't get that sense there. Okay, and added to that, you know how to say, how do you say, a, how do you call a person who speaks two languages? What about three languages? Four languages? A polyglot, right? Okay, what about one language? You call him an American. <laughs> and think about it. It's so true, isn't it? Everywhere else in the world, people speak two, three, or more languages. Here, we don't do that. But just like there's lots of words, and you know that, to say love, in Greek, there's lots of ways to say joy. And the joy that is expressed here, it's the only place in the Bible where that particular word for joy is used. When they beheld the child Jesus, when they saw the star and they found him, they were filled with unspeakable joy. It's a joy that nobody can remove. Once you have found the Lord Jesus, nobody can rob you of that joy that he is in your life in the midst of the mess, any mess you may be going through. And so this is our hope during Christmas. Not that we find joy, but that joy has found us. Because the fact that you are here this evening, there's no coincidences. It's a God incident. God wanted you to be here because God loves you and God wants you to hear this message of His, that He has been after you, searching for you, to fill you with His peace and to give you joy in the midst of any mess that you may find yourself in, that you may be going through. Any mess. God is there in the midst of the mess. And that's where our joy comes from. And that's the good news of the Gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. That He has found us. The joy has found us. So, in the Incarnation, God offers to meet us right where we are. To live with us and to never leave us. What more do we need to be happy? You know what our problem is? Do you know what our problem is? Well, do you? 
No? Okay, well that's why I'm here to tell you, okay? <laughs> you know what our problem is? Our problem is that we want miracles. We want the heaven to open, God to come down and to fix everything in our life. When the miracle is already there. The miracle is there. God is with us. What more do we want? We have been given the greatest miracle of all. God coming to dwell with us. And it's not like God came and then left. No, God came and stayed and is with us. And that's the miracle. My favorite, one of my favorite stories, but probably one that has made the most impact on me from the Bible, the story when Peter and the other apostles are in the boat and Jesus is there with them in the midst of a big storm. And there's a big storm raging all around them. Big storm. And Jesus is there in the boat and he's asleep. Jesus is sleeping. And Peter is all frantic and worried. And he, he's, oh, and he wakes Jesus up and says, how can you sleep here? Don't you see what's happening? We're perishing. Wake up, Jesus. This is what we do in our life too. We are in the boat. The church is the boat. We are in the boat. And we do the same thing. All frantic, all worried. Jesus, wake up. Are you out there? Wake up. The same thing that Peter did. Why? Because it's not enough for us, just like it wasn't enough for Peter, that Jesus is in the boat with us. It's not enough. We want more. We want Him to calm the storm. Whatever storm that may be raging on in our life, we want Him to calm the storm. And He says, I'm with you in the boat, Peter. Oh, ye of little faith. Jesus was there with him. It was all going to be okay because He was there. And yet it wasn't enough. And it's the same for us. That's why we're so miserable in our life. Because it's not enough. And the message that God wants to fill us during Christmas over and over again. That's why we celebrate Christmas every single year. Over and over again. Not that Jesus, you know, is going to be born again. He was already born. He's already with us. But for us to be reminded, we need reminders that's the whole, that's why you need to go to Mass constantly, to be reminded that God is with you. That's what you hear the most during Mass, isn't it? The Lord be with you. And you might say, well, there they go again, you know, the Lord be with you, over and over again. Why? To get it into our heads, because it's hard for us to internalize it, to get it, that God is with us. That's why the priest has to say it over and over again, the Lord be with you. Do you get it, in other words? The church is trying to say, do you get it? God is with you. Everything that we do at Mass is about presence. If you think about it. Everything. God is present. God is present. Look at Him in the bread. God is here. Look at Him in the cup. God is here. We raise the Gospel book. Look, God is here in His Word. God is here over and over again. God is here. Stop being miserable, in other words. God is here. It will all be fine. It will all work out in your life. God is with you. And into that, let's go into the first reading that we will hear for this coming Sunday. It's from Isaiah chapter 40. And we'll read from verse 1 through 11, and you can listen, okay? Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, give comfort to my people, says your God. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service has ended, that her guilt is expiated, that she has received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. A voice proclaims in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the wasteland a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. The rugged land shall be a plain, the rough country a broad valley. 
then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Proclaim. I answer, What shall I proclaim? All flesh is grass, and all their loyalty like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower wilts when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Yes, the people is grass. The grass withers, the flower wilts, but the word of our God stands forever. Go up unto a high mountain, Zion, herald of good news. Cry out at the top of your voice. Jerusalem, herald of good news, cry out, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Here comes your God with power, who rules by his strong arm. He is his reward with him, his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he feeds his flock. In his arms, he gathers the lambs carrying them in his bosom, leading the eaves with care. The word of the Lord. This reading tells us to empty our hearts so that there is room in them for the birth of something new and altogether unforeseen. Here Isaiah says, Clear the road for the Lord. Prepare a highway across the desert for our God. The way of the Lord is only apparent, according to Isaiah, after everything else has passed away. After the grass has withered, after the flower has faded away, and all the glories of the flesh have perished from the face of the earth. In other words, Bad things do happen in our life. They did happen in your life and they will continue to happen in your life. That's called being alive. And the glories of God shine through the bad things, the pain, the struggles, the suffering in our life. Only the word of the Lord stands forever, Isaiah says. Now, when we say the word of the Lord, if you look at... John's Gospel, John chapter 1, right from the very beginning, he tells you what the word is. John starts off his Gospel by saying, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word is Jesus Christ. We heard this particular gospel, John's gospel, the beginning of John's gospel on Christmas Day. Why? Because this is what we celebrate during this time. The word coming and taking flesh. And here we are told everything else withers, fades, and goes away. Only one thing endures, God. The word of the Lord will never go away will never end. God, in other words, is faithful. What does that tell us about our life? Here, this particular reading is so important because he tells us here, the grass withers, the flower wilts when the breath of the Lord has blown upon it. Yes, the people is grass. Think about this. The people is grass and the, the grass withers. In our own life, so much pain is caused because we have placed our trust in the people in our life. How many people have their life completely collapse when somebody in their life dies, like when your husband dies or your wife dies, and then you're thrown into a horrible depression or you even are thrown into taking your own life? This is what will happen. Everybody fades. People die in our life. In other words, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. What else happens in our life when your husband cheats on you 
Or when your wife cheats on you, your world collapses. Or when your kids betray you. That's what happens in our life. Everything is flux. And this is not something that is just here in the Bible or a Christian idea that Jesus said. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away, says Jesus. But also, there was an early Greek philosopher, an ancient Greek philosopher, who said the same thing. He said, everything is flux. Do you know what his name was? Gorgias. That was the name of the philosopher. Gorgias, okay? And here you have somebody else, okay? Gorgias telling you tonight, okay? <laughs> everything else... <laughs> Such humility, right? <laughs> Everything is flux. It's all going away. Everything. Our whole life is going away. That's what we have to realize. How many people have their world end when they get fired from their job? How many people have their world end when they've put all their trust in their health and all of a sudden their health goes. <gasps> How many people have their world end when their church fails them or when somebody in the church fails them? How many people have left the church because of the sexual abuse scandals when some priests abused children and some bishops covered it up and people left and they gave up or how many people leave after some priest does something to them or treats them badly or some scandal happens like somebody in the church steals money or has an addiction or something and they give up where is your faith? Is your faith in people? In men? Is your faith in things? In something? Everything is flux. It's all going away. You are to have your faith only in the Word that never passes away. You should write this one down. Malachi 3.6 in the Bible. I am God and I change not. Only God doesn't change. Governments betray us. And you know that. Governments betray us. Politicians betray us. People in the church betray us. People in our life betray us. You know that from your own life. The people who've inflicted the most pain in your life are those who you love the most and those who love you. That's the way it is. That's what the Word says. Everything withers and fades and goes away. Only the Word of the Lord remains. Where is my faith? Where have I placed my faith? This is very important for us who have placed so much of our hope in other people, in our work, in our government, in our bank account. How many people have their life end when the stock market crashes and their life savings go down the tube? The Bible makes it very clear. Only God is faithful. In God alone is my hope. In no one and in nothing else. During this time, we hear this so very clearly. If you see war, violence, terrorism, people dying, doesn't that sound like uh, the world we're in right now? Well, this was the same thing back then. It was the same thing all throughout the centuries. It will be like that until the end of the world. If you see war, violence, terrorism, people dying, natural disasters, know that this is normal. It's the normal order of this life that is passing away. When the, when the Bible says life as we know it is passing away, it means just, it just is saying that everything that you know all the, the people in your life, that's why people in your life die. You have to make peace with that. that that's, the, that's the way things happen. You are not to have your trust in other people. That doesn't mean that you should not care for the people in your life or forsake them. You're not to forsake the people in your life. 
You are to cherish them, hold on to them, but you are to know that if something happens to them, your trust is in the Lord. That's why Jesus says, you are not worthy of me unless you... He said, and he says, he, he, make, he, he uses very strong language. And people are shocked when he says that. Unless you hate, he says, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your relatives, you are not worthy of me. Right? He makes it... In other words, you, you have to not be attached to anything or anyone because it's all flux. It's all going away. The only one to be attached to is God. Unless God, unless Jesus says, unless I am number one in your life, there's something wrong there. God is to be our number one focus in our life and everything else flows from that. I had this one occurrence that, and many of you know this very well here from Las Vegas, when the housing market crashed, people lost their homes. And so many people had their lives collapse. Because where was their trust? It was in things. And I met this one lady, and this was in, in Sonoma, where in Sonoma, for a million dollars, you, you can't even buy a chicken coop. So they lost their home. And I met her, and she says to me, Father, pray for me because we've lost our home, and we're going to have to now move into a two-bedroom apartment. Our life is over. We have to put our things in storage. And I felt really bad for her. This was very devastating. Their whole life, their reputation, it was absolutely terrible. And... I felt absolutely horrible for her, but that same day God taught me a lesson. I met another lady who they were going through the same thing, the very same thing. And I, uh, she says, Father, you know, we're, uh, we've lost our home and we're going to have to move into a two-bedroom apartment. And I said to her, well, I, I'm so sorry, this must be devastating. And she says, who cares about our mansion that we're losing. When God has a mansion prepared for us in heaven, who cares? Who cares? You see, what we have forgotten is where we are headed. Are we not going to heaven or are we going to stay here forever? Because some of us live that way. Really, we live as if we're going to stay here forever. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't care to have a good job or have money. We all need money. You know, try going to the store and not having money. It doesn't work. But that shouldn't be the number one focus in our life. It's all flux. It all goes away. I'm headed for heaven. That's my destiny. That's the, if there's one thing you get from reading the Bible is that there is a heaven. And that's where we're headed. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has ready for those who love Him. But you have to love Him. And if I love someone, they're going to be number one and important in my life. And God doesn't want to be number two. God doesn't want to be number two to your wife or your husband or your things or your children. No. You are not worthy of me unless you renounce everything and come and follow me. Every single time when God called the apostles and anyone and, every, and everyone that he called, the, the Bible says they left everything and followed him. What does that mean? They left everything. You will read that if you read the Bible, you will read that. They left everything and followed him. That doesn't mean that they... <coughs> took all the money out of their bank account and now I'm putting it all into 21st century language. It doesn't mean that. They took all the money out of their bank account and then went and followed. No, it meant he became their focus in life. He was all for them. He filled them with the joy that they needed. And that's what we have to do. 
God has to be absolutely central in our life. And now I want to read for you Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 1 through 14. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Now, it says here, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. The, this particular gospel was written for a Jewish audience and they were absolutely devastated because their focal point in their life was the temple. You know the temple in Jerusalem is the place when you see the Jews who are there. All that's left is the wailing wall when they place petitions in there and the, they go like this. Well, that's, that, that's the central focus in the life of a Jewish person is the temple. And so the temple was everything for them. And Jesus says, I am the temple. I am the temple. I am to be the central focus in their life. You see, they were attached to a building as so many of us are attached to something or someone in our life. I am the temple. I am to be the focus. And so Jesus says, do you see all these things? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Why? Because it was destroyed in the year 70. Not one stone will be left here. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Oh, doesn't that sound like... What's, all, all these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Stand firm, endure, persevere is the message here. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Stand firm, in other words. Do not be alarmed. Do not be alarmed. And you are saying right now to yourselves, and this is supposed to be good news. This is supposed to comfort us. Where is the hope of the season? You are saying that everything we know and love is doomed and that the only reliable object of our devotion is the Word of God? In 2 Peter 3.10, the Bible tells us, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and what we are to do is to be like John the Baptist or Isaiah. Ready the way for the Lord to come. In other words, prepare your life for the Lord to come. The good news is that the Lord is coming. And the comfort that you have been waiting for is that you and I have been made for God. And just like we came from God, we are headed toward God. We are going back to God. This is just a pilgrimage here you are on. It's just a journey. Long, the Bible says longer for some. That's why people, some people die when they're old. And short for others. But that's the way it is. That's life. We are headed for something much better. You were made for God. You were not made for earth. You're not made for your house or for your work. 
You were made for God. That's where we're headed. That's our hope. And notice the Bible here in the passage that we read in Isaiah says what? Cry out at the top of your voice. Cry out. Do not fear. Cry out. Crying is not associated with happiness. And yet as Christians, while we see our world pass away, the tears we shed are to be tears of joy at the knowledge that the Word endures forever. The Word endures forever. It's always interesting, whenever I uh, go to funeral homes for the vigil of before the funeral the next day of, a, of someone, and whenever the family members are being comforted, somebody comes and says, Oh, be strong. Do not cry. And they try to tell them, Don't cry. And I say always the opposite. Cry. When we see all that's going on, when we see the death of our family members, we are moved to tears. That's only natural. When we see natural disasters, when we see the state of our world, the wars, the terrorism, what do we do? We cry. There's nothing wrong with that, to let our emotions out. We cry, but at the same time, the comfort in our life is what we believe, our faith, the presence of the Lord. The good news is that whatever it is that you have been crying for, in your life. And uh, John the Baptist, what did he do? The Bible says it's a voice crying out in the desert. Didn't he cry? He was waiting for the Lord. He was waiting for his Christmas. Wasn't he? Isn't that what we do in our life for whatever it is that we have been waiting for in our life? Maybe you have been waiting for that true love in your life. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Wanting true love. In other words, companionship. In the Bible, it's very clear, right from the beginning. Why did God make Eve for Adam? Not this Adam, of course, okay? <laughs> but, <laughs> Why did God make Eve for Adam, the Bible says? Because it's not good for men to be alone. That's why we're meant to be with other people. So if you're single and you're desiring to have a partner in your life, that's a good thing. I have a message for you if you've been searching. Catholicmatch.com Okay? <laughs> that's free advertisement. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. But that means you also have to make some necessary changes. Some people are single, you know, and they wonder why they're single. You have to make some changes in your life. If, no, if, if there's reasons why people don't want to be with you, maybe, maybe you've got to change, okay? It's like I had this one time, and this was in another parish I was at, okay? That's why, you know, I can bring things up that happened to me in, in other parishes. After I leave here, St. Joseph, then I'll be bringing up... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> anyway, in, uh, in a previous parish I was at, this guy came to talk to me, and he must have been like around 50 years old, I think. So, and he says, Father... I don't know why I can't find a woman, he says. I don't, please, can you tell me, like, why? Why can't I find someone? And I said, and he says, I've been searching for so long. And he's sitting there, and he's got, and he had a nice job. He told me about the job he had. It was a very good job. So it's not like he was poor. And he's sitting there, and he's got no teeth. <laughs> And all I wanted to say is, have you heard of dentures? <laughs> it's like something so obvious in our life. <laughs> if you're depressed, in other words, if you're depressed, maybe you need to see a doctor. If you've got issues from your past that you need counseling for, 
Whatever. Whatever it is, you got to deal with it. And whatever it is that you've been waiting for, that you've been crying for, the good news is, is that it's coming. God hears you. So if you've been crying for the gift of romance in your life, God hears you. If you've been crying for the return of your health, God hears you. If you've been waiting for a job that challenges you or for a better job or for a job, it's coming. In other words, if you are waiting for a better life, if you're waiting for a better life, you are not alone. All of us, in one way or another, are waiting for something better to happen in our life. All of us. If you, if you think somebody around you is, has like the perfect life, I have news for you. It's all a lie. There's no such thing as a perfect life. There are no perfect marriages. There are no perfect children. There's no perfect parish church. There are no perfect priests. And you're not perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're in good company if you're waiting for something better. With Isaiah and John the Baptist and all the other saints, just like them, most of us are waiting for something in our life. And we are in for something better. Christmas. That's what the Bible tells us. This life is a valley of tears. That's why there's so much suffering. It's a mess. But we have it better than Isaiah or John the Baptist. You know why? Because we are 21st century Christians. We have heard and we believe this story of this particular birth. Christmas. We have heard it and we believe it. We have it so much better. They didn't have it yet. We have it. The baby. The baby's ours. We have it. And think for a moment about babies and what goes into preparing the way for that new life to take shape in our lives. Parents do not know exactly what they are expecting, even if today, because of technology, medical advancement, they know the gender of their child, they do not know the rest of the story. Like, they don't know what the baby will look like. They don't know that. They don't know what the baby will be like. They don't know all the challenges that will come with the baby. All they know for sure is that nothing will ever be the same again. And the way most of them go about preparing for that is literally to clear a space in their home to create a nursery or if they don't have space in their own in their house for a particular room for their baby what they do is take a room in a corner in their own room in their in their bedroom and they clear that corner and they make it for the crib or whatever for the baby to have a place there they have to prepare for the baby to become part of their lives now christmas has come the question is, have you prepared a place in the inn of your own heart for the baby to dwell there? Have you prepared the place? Or are you still the same miserable person as before Christmas? <laughs> because if you are, it's your own fault. Really. Are you still the same? If, if, if that's the case, you haven't opened up the inn of your heart to let the baby in because something else is taking its place. Maybe it's your fear. you got to let go of the fear. Whatever it is that's keeping you away from experiencing that unspeakable joy that I spoke about that the Magi beheld when they found the star. Whatever it is, whatever it is, 
You got to clear the space in your own heart for the Lord to dwell there. You have not cleared a space or created a corner in your own room for the Lord to dwell. Now, one of my friends who used to be with me in the seminary, he left two years before, uh, before he was ordained, okay? He did find his Eve, okay? Even though his name is not Adam, but he did find <laughs> Eve. And uh, he got married. And they were getting, him and his wife were getting ready for baby number two in their lives. Now, uh, they're up to... Uh, baby number four. Their baby number four is coming. Okay? So, but they were getting ready for baby number two in their lives. And I remember this very well. Because as they were getting ready for baby number two, they decided, or I should say the wife decided, okay? <laughs> oh, you laugh because you know it's so true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they, I'm just going to say for the sake here of, uh, that they decided that the husband's study would have to go. And, and if you knew him, he's like the most studious person ever. Books, books, and books. He's a very studious person, a very smart guy. And they decided that his library would have to move to his office or they would have to or his books would have to be divided up into smaller bookshelves all around the house now this friend of mine loved his books so much so much and yet his library had to go the books had to go because the baby was coming there was new life on the way they had to be prepared for in order for the baby to dwell in us. We are called to prepare the way for this new baby in our lives, to make room for it by letting go of our old ways, our old loves, as painful as that may be sometimes. So it is either that, either you prepare the way for the baby, either you make room for the baby, or you have to prepare yourself for something else. Either you prepare room for the baby to come and dwell, or you have to prepare yourself for the fact that you will be passed over. The joy will pass you over. And that's what happens for so many people. It just passes them over. Christmas comes and goes, and they'll still be the same miserable people. <laughs> Hopefully that's not the case here this evening for all of us and that's why we have to be reminded of that over and over again because for so many of us there's no room in the inn of our hearts you see this story the christmas story that it tells us that there was no room in the inn there was no room in the inn and there's still no room in the inn for the baby jesus and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Dwelled. The only way He can dwell is if you let Him. He wants to live in you and with you, but you've got to let Him. How do we do that? See, we are waiting like John the Baptist. All of us, we are waiting. We are waiting. This is the waiting period. We have talked about that before, haven't we? This is the waiting period. We are waiting. And we are to wait without idols. The grass withers. The flower fades. Heaven and earth will pass away. Only when you stop believing in each of these, in the grass, in the flowers, in the earth, when you stop believing in all, all that's around you and start believing in God, only when you stop looking to everything and anyone and anything to save you, because no one can go to church who have absolutely no interest in changing. No interest. They just go to punch a card. That's why they want a mass that's 45 minutes, you know. <laughs> 
and you see that you know they go in and it does nothing it's like they're and then they go out and they're nasty people in the parking lot I mean it's unbelievable you know <laughs> supposed to change us challenge us if there's no challenge there's no change in our life that's why people like priests or preachers who don't challenge us, who just say, you know, nice and fluffy things and don't, you know, let's all just hold hands and sing Kumbaya, you know. <laughs> it's all great. We don't have to do anything, no change necessary. It'd be nice, you know, you'd, everybody would just love me if I just say, ah, you're fine, you don't have to do anything, you know. It's all good. Go and live as you're living, you know, and don't do anything. You don't have to change. But that's a lie. We all have to change. All of us. That's the only road to happiness. The road to happiness is through the cross. That's the road to happiness. If it doesn't challenge us, it doesn't change us, and doesn't bring us peace. And that's what the Lord comes in our life to do. So what are your idols, in other words? Like the idols of health, or, or the idols of friendship, or patriotism. But you say to me, well, these are all good things. Like being attached to my health, or to some friendship, or to, the, to my country. You know, those are all great things. Yeah, but the first criterion of an idol is that it gladdens your heart and nourishes your soul. And that is how you learn to believe in it and depend on it. And finally, it pulls you to itself and you believe that that's your only source of life. Like when you're attached to someone in your life or something. The only problem is that as long as our hearts and souls are full of what we know will sustain us, we have lost our ability to receive the yet unknown things that God has in store for us. When you start believing that, every, that you have it all already, then you will start believing that you don't need God anymore. And God says, I has not seen and ear has not heard what I have prepared for you who love me. Me, God says. You know what our problem is? There's no vacancy still. There's still no vacancy. We are all full up. There's no room at the end. God is looking for a nursery. But we are inside the study with the books and the door is closed. I don't want to give them up. And what our God is calling us to is not to forsake the things we love and want for our lives like the people we have in our lives. The people you have in your life are good. They're good. Not to forsake the things you have or your work or your money. All of these are necessary and they can add to your life. But we are called to forsake them as items. They are there. But if they're not there tomorrow, God will be there. God will be there. And I will be fine because God will be there. So what are you attached to? See, you are, you are told to hold things, but hold them lightly. You are to hold the people in your life lightly, not to cling to them. And to be willing to give them up when it becomes clear that they are taking up too much room in the inn of our hearts. And so, this evening, the question for us is this. What will it be for you and for me? What might new life look like for me? What's taking up too much room? The birth of God is only promised to those who have prepared a place for Him in their lives. As they wait without knowing. As we wait with nothing but faith, hope, and love. And we are told to wait in stillness. Psalm 46. For you, O Lord, my soul in stillness waits. 
Truly, my hope is in you. For you, O Lord, my soul in stillness waits. Not for someone or something. For you. Truly, my hope is in you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we thank you, Lord, for this time together. As we place our hope in you, and in you alone. And we ask you to help us to clear that space in our souls for you. Take away anything and everything that may be there that is not allowing us to have you enter and dwell in our lives. Help us to see what it is there that we need to get rid of so that you may come and dwell and remain there forever as we wait with great faith and hope focused on your love for us and your presence in our lives. And we especially trust in your great mercy. And we ask you for that grace as we glorify you now and forever, saying glory be to the Father and to the Son. And to the Holy Spirit. In the beginning is now, shall be, world without end. Amen. And may the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you for coming. Come back next week. We are in 2016. Happy New Year to all of you. And thank you for making the effort to be here this evening. I'm very happy that you have come.